we are going to start with our roll call. And we do have a quorum at this time. Lena Andrews. Dr. Jamil Bay. It's hard to look through the tiles quickly. Tammy Thompson. Karen Garrett. I see Karen. Welcome, Karen. Um, Jerome Jackson was not able to join us today. Um, we will see him next time. Councilwoman Deb Gross does not appear to be with us. Um, Mark Masterson. Here. Welcome, Mark. Deidre Washington. Marcus Reed. Dr. Paul Spradley. Here. Welcome, Paul. Alan Cisco. Here. Hey, guys. Hello, Alan. Derek Tillman. Here. Hi, Derek. Hello. Astrid to Clay. Here. And it's actually pronounced austere. Austere. Oh, my apologies. Not a problem. Thank you. <laughs> Kelly Ware. Present. Present. Hello. <laughs> I am also present. Great. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, we are going to move on to reviewing and approving the minutes. Has everyone had a chance to take a look at the minutes that were distributed? Um, any additions, corrections, verifications on information in the minutes? Move to approve the minutes. Mark Masterson moves to approve. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Derek. Motion and second. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? I'm hearing none, the minutes are approved. So we don't have any public comment today. Um, as we talk about regularly, it's always disappointing to not have public comment. Um, so we will all you know, keep our eyes, ears, and minds open to ways that we can engage more with folks. Um, the virtual setting is hard, but we will continue to try to encourage as much public participation as we can. Um, but for today, we won't have public comment, and we're going to move right into an exciting part of the agenda. Um, last time, we had talked about the opportunity for our group um, to weigh in on some decisions that could be made in a wider array of places, you know, in the housing arena. One of those entities that we always are partnering with, talking about, thinking about is housing and urban development. And we have an incredibly unique opportunity right now um, that Section 504 is being opened um, for review and comments. And Section 504 is critical when we're thinking about accessibility and fair housing. So fortunately, we have our partner, Megan Hammond, here. And she's going to be guiding us through a conversation about 504 and the input we might like to give back to housing and urban development from this community as to what we prioritize and what we're thinking about accessibility and fair housing. Uh, thank you kindly, Adrian, and for making the space to have the conversation amongst this body about uh, the potential for, as Adrian mentioned, uh, for the advisory board to submit a public comment to HUD's federal rulemaking on the update that is now occurring to Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Uh, it's a tremendous law uh, that is a very bureaucratic process, and the last time uh, the regulations were created was in 1988. And so HUD is looking to update what disability accessibility and federal programs in this context we're discussing housing and what disability accessibility means and looks like in 2023. Uh, so I have nothing if not PowerPoints and facts to go through the setting of what the laws are that we're discussing, um, as well as what the context is in the city of Pittsburgh. 
uh, in what we'll sh what I'll show is that I cannot understate enough the need that we have for accessible housing. Uh, and this is not income based. Certainly in this body, we're discussing low income housing, but the need for accessible housing is a citywide, neighborhood wide problem. Uh, and we'll go through the data that showcases just how old our housing stock is. And our housing stock largely predates any federal requirements regarding disability accessibility. So anything we do with the scarce resources that we have, one of the conversation I want to highlight today is it's not about meeting the federal minimums, but about us as a city having a prioritization and a creative approach to how we can make sure that the what we can build and renovate is made as accessible as possible within the resources that we do have. Uh, so let me share my screen into the PowerPoint. So too many screens open. Okay. Uh, so just to restate for anyone who hasn't heard me before, uh, my name is Megan Hammond. I'm the executive director of the Fair Housing Partnership of Greater Pittsburgh. Uh, our office is over in the Strip District, uh, and we are a private nonprofit, and we do contract with HUD's Department of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity uh, for fair housing activities uh, as what's called a Fair Housing Initiative Program, or a FIP, uh, for those of you following along with the government acronyms. Uh, and so to launch right into it, so let's have a context for what the laws are that 504 fits within. So 504, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, again, if you haven't yet watched the Netflix documentary called Crip Camp, it is a wonderful, marvelous documentary that goes through the process that it took that Section 504 didn't appear out of thin air. It was an amazing group of disability advocates that pushed and pushed and pushed literally to the point of wheelchair users were crawling up the steps of the Capitol in DC to highlight how inaccessible America was and continues to be. Uh, and it's a marvelous documentary for contextualizing what Section 504 is. And what the law says is that recipients of federal funds, all programs and activities, cannot discriminate on the basis of disability. And in our context, our context we're discussing housing and predominantly the physical accessibility of housing. And so the 504 regulations for what it means, what is required, when a housing developer is doing new construction or substantial renovations with federal funding were published in 1988. Uh, and we are extremely fortunate to have an update to the rulemaking process uh, for what those requirements are. And those comments are due to the HUD register by July 24th of this year. So one of the points I wanna underscore early on, and there's so many points to underscore, but what I want this body to understand is that when FHP and myself make comments about housing and housing programs that are coming to this body for funding. When there's discussions about disability accessibility, it's not about meeting the federal minimums. If there was an issue with the federal minimums, then you have a fundamental compliance issue, which I have the capacity to address. What we're looking at is the context in which Pittsburgh sits, in which our need is so overwhelmingly great that the federal minimums barely are a drop in the bucket. And what does it mean to this body to think about disability accessibility in the housing and housing programs that you fund that go outside of and beyond the federal compliance that I have a great trust in the process that at the point that the programs reach the vote for funding, that they are in fact compliant with the federal uh, laws. So also uh, to show some of the distinctions is that the federally funded housing under Section 504 also needs to respond to an individual with a disability. So disability is an identity, like all identities, it's a spectrum. In fact, disability is almost a misnomer. The word disability is meaningless until you identify what major life activity that disability is referring to. That refers to what an individual actually needs. Uh, I'll tell you, as many of you know, uh, I am deaf myself. I, I passed this hearing due to my speech and due to early intervention that occurred when I was a child. 
And I say that to explain I am in a deaf family. Both my parents are deaf uh, and two of my three siblings are deaf. And for some inexplicable reason, my mom continues to book uh, disability accessible hotel rooms. And those hotel rooms are pointless for us because those are about wheelchair accessibility. Uh, deafness does not require a roll-in shower. Uh, it may sometimes, those rooms, for example, have a strobe light uh, for someone knocking at the door. But what I really need, me personally, as a deaf person in that hotel room, is a vibrating alarm clock because that is the assisted device that I use to get up in the morning. There is no sound loud enough to wake me up when I don't have my hearing aids in. Uh, however, almost no hotel has that alarm clock. And so as a matter of pragmatism, I lug that heavy alarm clock in my luggage every time I travel in and go into hotels. And so disability accessibility is about responding to the individual as well. And so after development, construction, or renovation, there's also a need by our federally funded housing providers to respond to what's called a reasonable modification request by an individual. And if it's a, a legitimate request, to then do the installation of the grab bar, of widening the doorways, of the ramp, of a strobe light, and to do that at the housing provider's expense. And conversely, in the private market, a landlord has to allow a disabled tenant to do the modification, but it has to be done at the tenant's expense. So Section 504 is hugely meaningful in disability accessibility in our housing environment throughout the city. So, for the, in, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all of the disability laws that apply to housing accessibility, but to go through a couple in the context of what it means when housing developers are saying that we're in federal we're compliance with the federal requirements. Uh, we're also looking at the Fair Housing Act as it was called a design and construction component, and this was passed in 1988. And what this applies to and what I really want to identify, there is a difference between units that are designated for a specific disability. So a unit that is wheelchair accessible, a unit that is accessible for people who are blind or low vision or deaf or hard of hearing. What the Fair Housing Act says is that a person with a physical disability, predominantly limited mobility, should be able to go onto the property of a multifamily housing units four or more and view the property and go into any unit and pick any unit on that property to live in. It may not be exactly what you need as a matter of disability accessibility, but you have the choice to be able to rent and live in whatever unit that you pick. You're not shoehorned or sort of so-called forced into, oh, this is our disability accessible unit. You can live in any of the units on that property. Now, what is key for our city and what you've heard me talk about is that there are exemptions. There's meaningful exemptions. And those exemptions largely pertain to townhouses. The nature of townhouses is that they're a stack design with stairs. And so unless a townhouse has an elevator, a townhouse is exempt from design and construction. And only the most high-end townhouses have elevators. Uh, units that are above the first floor of multi-level housing, uh, so an apartment building, if that apartment building does not have elevators, only the first floor has to be accessible. Uh, and then single family homes that are unattached or multifamily housing that is less than four units. So I highlight this to say is that whenever we see proposals for units of any of these kinds of criteria, my concern is that we are adding to the inaccessible housing with our limited resources, as opposed to doing everything we can to make sure that every unit to the extent that we can is adding to the accessible landscape of our housing. And I will also add, I understand pragmatism. I understand the hillsides and the geographic nature of our city. And that's why the rulemaking process is so exciting because I implore all of us to be creative. It's not, it's not a zero sum game. I recognize, for example, that we have an infrastructure that has built row houses. There are sites in which townhouses are going to be maybe the only option available to us. And so we can discuss it. We can look at why should we have steps going into the entrance of the townhouse? Let's make it visitable. Or what if we can put an accessible half bath or a full bath on the first floor? Let's make sure the kitchen is accessible. Or what if we did something really simple and we're making sure that even if we're building a townhouse, that we're ensuring that all of the doors are the 32 inch minimum for wheelchair access. 
we see way too many properties throughout the region where a apartment building is built, no elevator, the first floor units meet the usable door requirements of having a 32 inch clear, clear opening space. And then the units above that property, above that floor are 29 inches or below. And disability is not a singular, what if there is a person who uses a walker or a cane uh, who's living on the second floor or above who's able to make it up because in our low income housing, especially people don't have choice and people move into whatever is available. Uh, and so there's steps we can take that even when pragmatic reasons dictate that we're building units that are exempt from design and construction accessibility, that we can be creative with engaging on what can we do to put any type of accessibility into this property uh, to keep continue chipping away uh, at the inaccessibility of our housing in our region. And just to underscore how minimum uh, the design and construction components are, it is simply that a person with a disability can come onto the rental property, can go to the leasing office, go to the common use areas, the community room, the, the mail-in area, get to their apartment, enter the door, use the light switches and the outlets and go into and out of their kitchen and bathroom. Uh, and also that there is reinforcement done at the point of construction or renovation to the bathroom walls. Uh, because if you don't have experience with grab bars, if you don't reinforce the walls before you put grab bars in, uh, plaster or drywall is not built to withstand body weight. Uh, and if you pull your body weight or put your body weight on a grab bar in a wall that's not reinforced appropriately in the studs, the entire wall will come down as is the disabled individual who is at the moment leaning on that grab bar. So they're pretty straightforward needs that are critical that they're done correctly at the construction or renovation. And then lastly, in the context of the disability laws that we're discussing, I want to raise the Americans with Disabilities Act because this is the disability law that most people tend to refer to the most. And it frustrates me in the housing space because I want everybody listening to know that the ADA is about public access. It is about getting onto the property and housing and those common use areas, but it is not about your unit. And so when we discuss only the ADA as it pertains to housing, we are not recognizing the other laws that are saying there is so much struggle being disabled in mainstream society as it is, that the reason that we have the laws that we do is to make sure that my actual home is the safest, most accessible space for me to live, and that I'm not facing those barriers at home. And so the ADA applies to housing, but the other laws that were Section 504, the Fair Housing Act, the Architectural Barriers Act, are the real key laws in understanding what it means to disability accessibility in housing. Uh, the ADA is looking at a uh, you know, place of employment, government facilities, uh, and largely any, uh, any component of uh, modern day society that is open to the public. So what I wanna highlight continuously as we go from the laws, Let's move to the laws to Pittsburgh's built environment. And in the city of Pittsburgh, this is using just census data, this is just math, 48.8% .8 of all of our housing units were built in 1939 or earlier. That is almost half of our entire housing stock is almost 100 years old. And that is massive as a percentage. And to give you the context for how massive that percentage is, in Allegheny County, that percentage is 28.3%. Now we can discuss uh, all the different urban design components that occurred at that time. And we can discuss how the suburbs were built in the post-war boom. Uh, and so there's reasons why uh, an urban center such as the city of Pittsburgh has such an old housing stock and the construction focus that was occurring uh, back a hundred years ago that focused on the city of Pittsburgh. And then when you look at the metropolitan statistical area of, of Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh MSA, which is seven Southwestern counties, Pittsburgh of all seven, eight counties has by far, it doesn't even come close to the highest amount of housing, the largest percentage that was built before 1939. And most of the property, there's no other county that's even in the 40%. And Allegheny County is in fact, 
there's other counties in our region that have more older housing than Allegheny County as a whole does. But Pittsburgh as a city, as an urban center, has an extremely old housing in which so much, if not all of that housing, is utterly and completely exempt from all the laws that we just talked about. The nuances of the laws that we talked about, key components of compromises that were necessary in passing those laws, included grandfathering in the built environment as it existed at the time of the passage, and additional accessibility requirements only come into play when federal funding is involved. So that's the context. And to further look at what construction and housing has looked like in our region over the past hundred years, is that I put all this math in front of you to show that we at no point in the past hundred years have had a housing boom uh, since the fifties. And so this 13.2% of, so of our total housing units in the city right now, 13.2% of them were built from 1959, 1950 to 1959 in the 50s during the post-war uh, uh, construction boom. And so as you look at the percentages of housing that were built in other decades, ranging from 8 to 6%, as we get into the modern era, we go under 5% of new units being added uh, to our, our housing environment. And that goes to say that the units that we have built that are loosely, and I say loosely because there's all these nuances of if it's multifamily housing, if it has elevators, if it has townhouses, but the units built before 19, the units built after 1990, which is based on the math, it's really 1991 that we need, three decades of units built that are applicable to modern day disability accessibility requirements and housing is a total of 10.6% of all the units in the city. And so not only do we have 10, almost 11% of units that are even jurisdictional to accessibility laws and housing, but we have almost half of the remaining housing older than 1939. And I'm sure all of us have different experiences with that, what that means pragmatically. Uh, I'll say that my first apartment out of college, the window broke and the top pane fell down. And I was looking at it. And I realized that why the top pane had fallen down was because the infrastructure inside the window that controlled the pulley system that controlled the window going up and down was made out of rope because the window was original to the building's construction in 1910, 1910 or something like that. Uh, so there is a real impact on how old our housing is throughout the city and a real impact on the fact that so much of the housing in our city is simply not jurisdictional to accessibility requirements uh, and require federal funding in order for those requirements to come into play. Uh, and otherwise, we're only looking at new construction. And the construction that we're seeing uh, is not nowhere matching uh, the construction that occurred uh, prior to largely the 60s. So I want to humanize this for a second, and I'll explain why. But let me explain Rhoda's story. So Rhoda was a tenant in Oakland, and she was a client at FHP. I handled her call uh, myself, and this was a few years ago. And what happened with Rhoda is both her legs were amputated, and she used a wheelchair. And at the point of the amputation, she was living in a nursing home. So you may understand that people with disabilities don't want to live in nursing homes and assisted living in the idea and the concept of federal laws, the, the concept of what we believe in as a city, I believe, is integration, uh, is inclusivity, and that people with disabilities have access to any of these units that we're talking about and to have the opportunity to live there. So what's interesting about Rhoda's story is that she was on FHP's phone, not because her apartment was inaccessible, but because she was trying to keep it. And what had happened was she had been transitioned out of the nursing home and she was in federally funded housing in Oakland. And Oakland is a highly desirable location to have affordable housing, to, to move into affordable housing in the city of Pittsburgh. And she called us because her property manager allegedly had approached her after Rhoda had been hospitalized. And Rhoda required relatively regular hospitalizations because if you understand when you have an amputation, that can come with circulatory issues that causes clots and other issues that can require hospital care uh, to touch base and to address, and then you're able to, to return home. 
So Rhoda's property manager allegedly confronted her and said that because of her hospitalization, that the property manager was requiring that Rhoda move into a two bedroom unit and get a living aid. Rhoda was terrified of a living aid. She wanted her independence. She didn't want someone telling her what to do. She are living with her. She already had aids. She already had the services and features that she needed to live independently, but she was terrified of turning down the two bedroom and the living aid because the property manager was allegedly threatening that if she didn't do so, they were going to call the area agency on aging to have Rhoda put back into a nursing home. And that, that was why she was on our phones, because that was an absolute nightmare scenario. But what we discovered while we talked to Rhoda is that she lived in federally funded housing uh, that had been built prior to 1990, in the decades earlier. And the doors, even after the renovation into federally funded housing, were extremely narrow. And her knees and elbows were getting hurt and bruised going in and out of the doors. And she couldn't even get inside her kitchen and her bathroom. And so she was having to do sponge baths in her bed and she couldn't even prepare food or put any food in the microwave in her kitchen. And all she wanted was to keep this unit. But what we understood in that call is that because of the 504 requirements of her, the funding type of her unit, that the housing provider was actually obligated to make the unit accessible for her as a wheelchair user. And so after her unit was made accessible, uh, based on uh, our ability to move a case forward using Section 504, in Rhoda's own words, she talked about all she needed, all that made a massive difference in her life was being able to go into her kitchen to get into the bathroom, roll up underneath her sink because the cabinets had been removed, the piping has been insulated so she won't burn herself on the hot water pipe and wash her hands. Uh, and it was absolutely a phenomenal, phenomenal experience for her. Uh, and to showcase you, I wanna show you what it means for her to have access to her unit. And what I mean by what it means for her to have access to her unit as a wheelchair user, I wanna make three critical points as you look at disability in housing. One is intersectionality. I wanna be abundantly and overwhelmingly clear that when myself or anyone at the Fair Housing Partnership is discussing disability accessibility in housing, we are discussing intersectionality. We are not discussing by proxy any certain group or community of people. We are discussing all of Pittsburgh, every single neighborhood, every single community, not only seniors, but groups of uh, families with children as well, all need access to accessible housing. This is impactful and important to every single unit we build and is not a senior issue. Also too, is what happened after this renovation was done. What happened is after we, we filmed, I, I share Rhoda's name and, and her photos and her story with her explicit permission. We created a video with her. And it you know, wasn't even a year after the renovation was done, uh, Rhoda unfortunately passed away. And she's not the only client that this has happened to at, at a, that has passed away during the process with FHP. And I say that because what I'm asking for us to consider as we look at disability accessibility in the developments and the renovations proposed here is that we get it right at the point of construction because it has such a meaningful impact on actual human beings quality of life and there are so many instances in which there are people who could have had a completely different quality of life if these laws had compliance meaningful compliance at the get-go rather than it coming in a reactive way when someone reports it and we come in after the fact in order to, to address it. So why this body is so important is looking at it now, as opposed to it being a retrofit later because of a complaint. And I also just want to underscore and to go back to that concept of the federal minimums. What the Section 504 review is doing now is looking at the federal minimums and what does it mean to change them if we do change them. But regardless of what happens with Section 504 at the federal level, I know that to all of you, I've, we've worked together long enough and I know you all enough to know that it matters to you as well. It matters to the city of Pittsburgh as well. 
And so what can we do to prioritize to the extent that we can pragmatically? It's not an overnight solution. There's not, there's not enough resources to fix this immediately. But how do we look at every single housing development and housing program and consider and make sure that it's its inception and its uh, actual implementation is not simply meeting these laws, but we're finding creative ways to make sure that they're accessible for people with disabilities uh, because the need in our city is so extremely large and overwhelming that the federal minimums are having us barely getting by with having units for people to access and that in order to make a meaningful dent in the age of our housing stock and its accompanying access inaccessibility is that we take purposeful and intentional looks at what it means to not simply be in federal compliance, but what it means to be creative with the limited funds that we have to tweak and do what we can to make units accessible in any way that we can at the point of construction and renovation. Uh, so what I'll go into um, and what that leads us to and so the, the concept and purpose of this conversation uh, is what we pulled out of the rulemaking process uh, at um, the 504 proposed rule is a few questions that pertain to the kind of activities that this body funds. Uh, and so I'll just go through you. You can you know, I'm extremely interested for, for any thoughts that you have now um, and to make any discussion points that you have, you're welcome to follow up with discussion points. And what we'll do over the next month uh, is we'll draft a comment letter from this body. Uh, that draft will go out for everyone to review. Uh, and then we'll ask the body uh, to vote on that draft being finalized uh, so that it can be formally submitted to the federal registrar. Uh, and what it will do, not simply for us to have this discussion, but it will show the federal government, the city of Pittsburgh's commitment that I know we all have in what we need to do, what we can do uh, to make disability, disability accessibility and housing in 2023 more meaningful and up to date as opposed to what it was made in, in 1988. Uh, so to open up uh, the discussion points, uh, and I'll just give an example or two and I won't spend uh, long on, on the individual questions, and I'm interested to hear any thoughts that you have. Uh, is So one of the concepts is what we've been talking about is that newly constructed housing is designed and construction to be readily accessible uh, for people with disabilities with current minimums in multifamily housing. Those minimums are currently 5% for mobility impairments uh, and 2% for vision or hearing impairments. Uh, and so that goes back to what features, what accessibility features do those units have? Uh, and so the question that HUD is asking the nation is, should we increase this minimum? Um, should this be higher in terms of how a unit should be explicitly, how many units should explicitly have, uh, for example, a strobe light alarm clock, uh, a strobe light fire alarm um, or doorbell, for example? Uh, how many units should explicitly have lowered countertops or moved countertops um, and uh, be explicitly for, for wheelchair users? Uh, so I'll turn it over. Uh, any any thoughts uh, by anyone on this concept of if the minimum should be raised? Megan, I think that this is a really interesting question on a variety of levels. And I think to a point you made earlier, maybe what our community really thinks is it's not percentage-based. It's that conception of how to build base housing in such a way that it facilitates renovation and modification going forward for individual needs. Um, so I had the pleasure of meeting with some folks from the City County Task Force on disabilities and, and they also raised that issue of Sometimes it's just over accessible. You know, we, we might have, you know, 20 units that are over accessible, but then we have 50 people that are waiting for minimal accommodations. So, you know, for me, as I'm thinking through the HOF lens, I don't know that there's a magic number. I think it should be more, you know, in my own thinking, it's do we start to talk about this in more of the sense of how do we set up housing in such a way that it can be modified. And it can be modified in a way that economically makes sense, aesthetically makes sense, and makes sense from a constructability standpoint. And I 
always have an answer when it comes to housing, Adrian. And so <laughs> I, I love your point. And I would say to that point, one of the considerations I would raise to the city um, is I understand that the funding requests that are being made at this point is that we're in a pre-development, pre-construction stage. But to the extent possible that a housing management, how a, a landlord has been selected, is that what can be provided at this stage, to, if, it doesn't have to be final, but to make sure it's intentional, is what the reasonable accommodation modification process is by that housing provider. Is there a process in place by this developer or their housing operation arm that in the rotas of the new properties are going to be able to put in that request and get that request met that's obligated under 504 to make individual modifications that are needed to the unit. And what Rhoda was saying to her property manager at the time, she kept asking for a bigger unit, but the property manager wasn't understanding that she meant for wheelchair access and not that she was asking for a two-bedroom unit. That's great. All right, so I'll go to the next question. As I know, I, I, have, I always have a fire hose of information, uh, and so I, I love and would uh, welcome any comments after the fact as well. Uh, you're welcome to email me, uh, and, and I love having conversations about housing. Uh, so one of the other questions, we have about five here. Uh, does the lack of accessible units discourage applications from eligible units? To what extent is the lack of accessibility a barrier to individuals and families utilizing HUD-assisted housing programs. So this, this is the age-old question that to those who have been historically marginalized, oppressed, and kept out of certain entities, just because you make it available doesn't mean that people come. There has to be a trust and openness, a outreach and education that it is now available and not simply available, but that you're welcome. And so this consideration of, I'm curious if anyone in their experiences and the roles that you serve have seen concerns where families with disabilities are not even trying to get into the federally funded housing uh, because of previous experiences, because of just the knowledge base of how inaccessible, why try is the concept. Yeah, so um, maybe oh, oh, go ahead, Derek. Um, uh, sure. Um, so I, I can, I just was trying to ponder on your first question as well as this one. Um, so I'll start with the first question. Um, in at least, uh, today in our experience, uh, you know, in, in our new construction projects, um, that, you know, ha has, you know, certain requirement for, uh, ADA or UFAS, uh, units, um, we have not seen a, an, um, uh, basically a need um, or response for, you know, a, a lot of units beyond what we, we had, you know, available. Um, so I, th I think I, I would just speak as it relates to new units. Um, you know, we had a waiting list, for example, we had a waiting list of 400 um, and you know, the amount of responses for the ADA accessible units were pretty much commensurate with what we had allocated in that building. So uh, from, from that standpoint, I wouldn't necessarily um, advocate for a higher percentage, but I do think um, having accommodations for, you know, kind of, um, you know, existing units is is something that you know we should continue to uh to to look at and make sure that there's available funding for it i think that's quite consistent with what we discussed derek and and exactly to adrian's point that we see over access accessibility um, when there's a number of households and families who there's an individual who uses a walker or a cane or maybe a wheelchair temporarily and so simply making sure that all of the units are usable for people with disabilities uh, in terms of, of having access to all of the units that then can be modified to an individual's needs after the fact that I, I certainly hear your point. Um, just uh, focusing on the second question, um, from my, you know, I started my career as a uh, occupancy specialist with the housing authority. So I was the first person that applicants would come and see. Um, 
so I've seen hundreds of applicants come in and there is definitely a barrier to accessibility. Um, you know, even with between 2010 and 2020, when you think of accessibility, you're thinking of UFAS and you're thinking of wheelchair accessibility and the concept of, um, you know, having a hearing impaired unit is, you know, seen as revolutionary as instead of the standard. Mm -hmm. um, and seeing that applicant come in from by the time they get into deemed eligible for a unit. And then once they get into the unit, having to go through the reasonable accommodation process, simple, the, the barrier to even filling out the application is one, but then going through this really uh, nuanced process that has, you know, some type, oftentimes languages in legalese, there's a lot of writing. If you're someone with a hearing impaired, uh, hearing impaired or vision impaired, um, there's a whole, you have to then request a reasonable accommodation to have someone there to then translate for you. So the simplest thing, like just simply requesting, this is what I need, or even art articulating what your need is, um, is really a mountain compared to, to compared to the average person trying to, you know, just get something done for their unit. Um, so there's definitely, the process is extremely stressful, extremely stressful and arduous. And um, the communication is very difficult. And if you're someone who has to physically come into an office, who has to find um, an access van ride to get there and then have um, a live-in aid, maybe have to come with you to do whatever your task is. Um, so from experience, and I, and I, you know, you can still kind of see this today with, with folks who are just trying to get any type of accessible resource within the city. If, if it, you know, back in the day when everything was downtown and we came in physically to do things. Um, every little step makes the process a hundred times harder. Um, so that I've seen it, just seen folks be discouraged and just say like, this isn't worth the time or just become um, the sense of despair of just like, this is the toll, the mental toll of it, uh, not worth the fruit of, at the end. And then when you are denied, for whatever reason, and again, like you were saying with Rhoda, um, there's like miscommunication and no, I don't want a unit, I want this. So when you then you have to go back and do an appeal and all of that process. And this is just, again, speaking from my experience, it makes it that much harder. So it, they're absolutely that this, I know it still happens today. Um, and that the, you know, even having the accessible units, if we are not ensuring that there are equitable practices, from the management office, from the second that um, applicant comes through the door uh, till they leave, um, and particularly, you know, in a population that wants to age in place. So, if someone who may not have a, fit, a disability when they first start there, but may have one as they age, or has an, a disability that is quote invisible, a chronic illness, and as that um, illness progresses, they might need support. Um, it should not be a fight to do those things, and those processes should be clear. And I think for, for a lot of folks, that process, if it's in the private market, I I, I can't even imagine how difficult it can be. I uh, love hearing your comments, Aster, and, and your experience as the, as the person in first contact. And I concur with a, a great need for uh, cultural competency at the point of the contacts who are engaging with the tenants directly, where the word disability, again, is, is just meaningless until the point of contact must understand how to ask questions and identify what is actually needed and to not have stereotypes in mind and to say, well, you wouldn't need that. That doesn't apply to what you need. I understand how this works and what you're asking for isn't uh, what act you actually uh, require. And those engagements to your point about despair and disappointment are monstrously frustrating. Uh, I will share from the point of first contact that I've seen is the number one request that's made after construction or renovation um, is that a door, whether it's the front door or a side door that's being used by tenants that is closer to the elevator they use or the stairs, that the door is uh, disability accessible regarding uh, it has a handicap button, that it's automated. And all too often at the point of construction, the automated doors aren't a requirement uh, and, and they're not installed. Uh, and we often get requests to go through the process that you outlined of providing the documentation to show that we do in fact need to have uh, that handicap button and the automated door available uh, for people to come and go from the property safely. Um, excuse me, um, Evan or Jad, I think uh, Dr. Paul Strat, 
Spradley is in the waiting room trying to get in. Uh, city staff, is there someone possibly trying to join by phone? Yes. Uh, I'll go to the next question. I appreciate yeah. everyone's feedback and conversation. I really, really love, uh, you know, hearing from uh, people other than my own echo. Uh, and so to to also discuss uh, what we're looking at is how does housing choice vouchers or what we know as Section 8 uh, and other tenant based rental assistance, how do they apply to affordable housing opportunities for disabilities? Uh, they're critical for ensuring permanent housing and crucially community integration. There's not enough affordable units themselves for people to move into. Uh, and so often when people are trying to transition out of say a nursing home, uh, vouchers or other individual tenant-based assistance are the key point in being able to either integrate into the community um, or being able to have access when the waiting list for units themselves are, are next to impossible. Of course, all of these programs have, have different barriers and limitations. Uh, so the sub questions that are being asked is what challenges exist with Section 8 in the private rental market um, for disabled uh, individuals who are voucher holders? Uh, are there barriers in the process, in the housing search, uh, preclusions for having to live in aid in the private market when you're using a voucher? And is there geographic diversity? We don't want segregation for any identity or any intersectional individual where we are grouping people in certain neighborhoods. Uh, and so what I'll say to that is what this is requiring from the perspective we have at FHP is the housing search and the fair housing understanding by the private landlords who are accepting the vouchers. Uh, that in and of itself can be a major barrier where the landlords are not aware of, I understand it's an old building, I understand that it was built in 1906, but you can't say that this building is too old, it's not for this type of people, it's not, you wouldn't be happy here. Uh, I, I, this is, I don't want to put a stair lift in this, you know, older historic property uh, is not something that our private landlords should be saying and engaging on um, when a tenant with a voucher uh, is, with, who has a disability uh, is engaged in the private market. Uh, so to open it up to any other thoughts or questions on uh, Section 8. Um, and just a quick introduction. I mean, do you have Natalie Ryan here with us from Action Housing? Um, it's sort of beyond the voucher. There's a variety of different types of tenant-based rental assistance that are now on the market, a lot more um, unique configurations for supported housing options um, where a person's not only getting housing support but services, then just straight rental assistance um, and everything in between. So there's lots of different ways that folks might be paying rent um, that may you know, open them up to unique challenges or barriers because it's not just being a renter, it's then being a renter with a subsidy and the subsidy has, you know, it's, it's tentacles attached as well. Absolutely. And we might have some property, we might have some property owners here who are utilizing these different rental assistance options. And we would love to hear, you know, what's working well, what might be challenging. Well, in the interest of time, uh, I'll go. I think we have one or two more questions to go through to, to bring up any concepts. And again, um, we are soliciting concepts and comments and follow ups all month uh, to, to draft and put a comment together under uh, the HOF. Uh, and then uh, HUD's looking at so we just went through three of the laws. There are more uh, that pertain to disability accessibility with federal funding and housing. Uh, and so, how can they be harmonized? Uh, how can there be greater consistency to enhance the accessibility of the design and construction of housing that's covered by multiple federal accessibility laws? Uh, I will give you all here an example. Uh, FHP hasn't been involved in a case with multiple fair housing organizations uh, in different states, including Ohio and New York, uh, regarding an entity, a developer, a developer and operator of housing uh, called Clover uh, Group, Clover Communities and they have been building in the private market 55 and over housing. 
None of their units have been built or their properties have been built in the city of Pittsburgh uh, and Western Pennsylvania. They have all are in the county, Allegheny County, uh, as well as uh, another county, uh, I'm forgetting which one, as well as Erie. And there's two properties in the Scranton area. Uh, but the case that we were involved in uh, is regarding the design and construction where the properties were built as an H or an I in the, uh, the, the building itself as an apartment building. And it met the ADA standards of having an accessible route when you park, had curb cuts and went into the main entrance to go to the leasing office as a member of the public. But when you moved in, you would use the entrances on the wings on the on the sides that were the other components of the H or the I, because that's where the elevator was that served your unit closer. And those parking areas and those entries had no curb cuts, no accessible route. There was no accessible route of the covered parking garages that you could pay extra for. There was no accessible route into that building. Um, and then additionally, the bathrooms were built too small in the properties overall. And so last August, there was a settlement uh, valued at several million dollars for the retrofits that are now taking place, where all of these properties across multiple states went through several reviews by municipalities in assessing their compliance. And it may or may not have included their different safe harbors, their different components for how disability accessibility is reviewed by municipalities and none of the matters regarding fair housing were identified and all of the properties were built uh, in such a manner as to necessitate millions of dollars in retrofit uh, now. So simply to raise is that there is certainly, as we all understand, multiple laws in place uh, and a lot of struggle with uh, having them all applied in a comprehensive way that also doesn't uh, delay or unnecessarily delay the process. Any other thoughts on that with synchronizing, harmonizing, or dare I say the word synergy on uh, looking at how the laws apply? All right. And the last question I want to raise, um, if anyone has uh, any experience or has seen, uh, what is the cool accessibility features that have been created? This is 2023. Uh, Pittsburgh is a technology hub. Uh, we have moved past uh, widened doors and roll-in showers, which are critical. But what are the other more innovative options that have been created? Uh, there are a number of fascinating inventions and features that are cost-effective, not expensive, uh, different ways to look at pull down cabinets or cabinets that collapse and are accessible from a wheelchair height uh, and other concepts of what has modern technology done for us and how can we apply that into affordable housing for disability accessibility. Uh, any thoughts or experiences with that? Um, advanced automation technology, it's very, fairly simple for things that you can literally put a tag on things like light switches and different products and you can turn them on off and on using your um your phone so i think a lot of automation and ai can be helpful particularly for example someone who is uh vision impaired uh amazon alexa for as a just a blanket example you can ask it to do things for you um call this person uh look up this item of information. Um, so having that, just using these pre-existing technologies to automate as many things as possible. So instead of the actual user having to physically do them, there is AI to support that. And it comes in handy, particularly in a safety situation uh, where you can, even now, if anyone has Amazon Alexa, can program it to call 911, call a loved one, um, you know, take, you know, do a grocery list, buy things for you that you need to do. So I think there are very uh, low cost measures using automation, using AI, using technology to help with just activities of daily living, which are typically what are used to determine if someone needs a reasonable accommodation and that how impactful that is. Um, so there's, that's a, uh, I would say a low cost and very accessible in the market tool that we could be, um, you know, ex exploring. I love it. It's a wonderful idea. And for folks who might not be accessibility um, product geeks, 
I have had the luxury over the last six months to participate in some vendor trainings and some of the new things on the market are really very cool. Things like, as Megan mentioned, you know, fortifying the walls in a bathroom so you could put up something like grab bars is important. But it even goes beyond that where there's rail systems that you can actually embed in walls um, that allow for placement of things like railings alongside a toilet for someone to be able to get up and down. And those rail systems actually have convertible parts. So at such time when different people are moving in, you can actually do different bar installations to meet their height, their weight, their particular need. Um, and again, that's something that's embedded in a physical structure that is going to be there forever and be able to accommodate these products. Um, so you actually can do accessibility modification after modification after modification at a very different cost than you would have to do if you were doing that from scratch renovation. So there are some, you know, if, if you ever are interested in participating in any of those sessions, um, we hope to be bringing more to developers locally to see some of these unique concepts because the Derricks in the room um, are the folks that really could help us push some of these unique features into you know, standard operating procedures when Allegheny County and City of Pittsburgh do their housing, which would be transformative and incredibly exciting. No, ab absolutely, Adrian. And I've, I've, I'm a geek of technology of all different types. Uh, and there's also interesting things being done with doors. Uh, so there's long term been, you could have a keypad in order to enter a door instead of having to use a manual key, uh, different key fob structures for all the different issues that come with using a doorknob um, or with come with operating a manual door. Uh, with a relatively low cost way to look at how someone uses and interacts with the door in order to get in and out of their unit. So uh, again, I'm always, if anyone has any links they want to share or concepts, the only thing I ask is that we're not looking at gloves that do sign language. They don't work. The technology is not there yet. Uh, and uh, we will, it's just, uh, we'll, we'll wait on that one. Uh, but I love to see uh, looks at uh, what you're looking at with the tech space. So uh, I will dovetail. I apologize for, I appreciate everyone's uh, immense uh, time today and considerations and discussion. Um, uh, we will compile that into a draft letter. Uh, and again, please, please, please uh, follow up with any thoughts you're having, uh, any thoughts you want to get out and have to consider. Uh, and we will compile a draft together uh, for a presentation, a, a comment to be posted to the Federal Registrar showing uh, Pittsburgh's commitment uh, to addressing disability accessibility and housing in, in 2023. Uh, thank you all. Thanks, Megan, and thanks to the group. And we're hoping in this new year, we really have the opportunity for, I mean, I guess it's not so new now, we're about halfway through the year, but really, again, thinking about ways that we can intersect with the larger dialogue about affordable housing is important and all of the prongs of affordable housing and fair housing. So please, you know, to the group, continue to raise opportunities for us to discuss, engage, dive a little deeper, um, you know, just think about what we're doing related to housing through a different lens. Um, so thank you, Megan. And I know we have, um, we have a lot of things to talk about today. So our minds are going to be spinning by the end, but please reach out with comments after um, any follow-up that you'd like to do. We're going to move into talking with Natalie Ryan to talk about the housing stabilization program, which is one of those resources that folks are using to take a rental assistance um, mechanism into the community to be able to pay um, back rent, forward rent, and you know, again, thinking about how these rental assistance types can also fit into the portfolio of our affordable housing overall. Welcome, Natalie. Thanks, Adrian, and thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Natalie Ryan. I am the Housing Assistance Program Manager at Action Housing. I'm overseeing what uh, Allegheny County is calling the ASK program, since we love our acronyms. That stands for the Allegheny Housing Stabilization Collaborative. Um, this was born out of partnerships that were forged during COVID-19. Uh, with the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. So as many of you may know, uh, the Emergency Rental Assistance Program was money from the Office of the Treasury 
Uh, in Allegheny County here, we served almost 30,000 households uh, with $150 million of rental assistance. And what we learned at the end of ERAP, uh, which ended uh, July 31st of 2022, is that obviously that did not solve the eviction crisis. Uh, it did not provide all that everybody needed to remain stable in their housing. So uh, what we did was put together a plan to try and utilize the funding that Allegheny County and the city of Pittsburgh have to use those resources in the best way possible. Uh, so Allegheny County DHS uh, awarded that uh, request for proposal to Action Housing as the lead organization. Uh, and we put together the collaborative uh, with our main partners who are the YWCA of Greater Pittsburgh, the Urban League of Greater Pittsburgh, uh, Rent Help Pittsburgh uh, are our primary partners that are working with us to uh, process applications, uh, as well as some housing stability services, uh, which are things that we added after the end of ERAP to try and build in some extra safety nets uh, for folks using uh, community resources. Um, really great organizations like WAVE uh, to do rental counseling and financial counseling. Uh, as well as Just Mediation Pittsburgh to do mediations between landlords and tenants, uh, and um, uh, the Financial Empowerment Centers uh, to also provide some uh, financial counseling to folks who are interested. So the result of this proposal was putting together all of those partners to utilize the infrastructure that we had for ERAP and take different sources of money that Allegheny County has historically had. Uh, housing Stabilization Program is one of those funds, as well as Housing Assistance Program dollars, uh, Family Rental Assistance Program dollars. Uh, there's another fund called Hello Baby that we get referrals from uh, the from Healthy Start, uh, as well as Family Eviction Prevention money, uh, which is some Office of the Treasury money for rental assistance as well. So. One of the things that had to happen in Allegheny County was we had to adapt our uh, our data infrastructure to be able to assist folks with their growing needs. So ERAP and family eviction prevention uh, money had limits uh, of 15 months of assistance, uh, $10,000. And when folks reached those limits, um, they were almost out of options. So Adding housing stabilization program dollars, as well as the other funds that I mentioned together, allows us to have one system for folks who are in eviction proceedings or have mediation uh, agreements with their landlords to be able to put those funds together, pay them at one time to their landlord and prevent their evictions. Um, so in working with folks, uh, we have built trust with people in the community uh, who have come back to us who may have received ERAP or Family Eviction Prevention Program money previously. Uh, we've built relationships with landlords uh, because they may have, they have, many of them have received funding from us in the past and are comfortable with uh, the speed with which we're able to pay them. Uh, and we can direct deposit money into their account. We can mail them a check if they'd prefer. Uh, but generally speaking, um, historically rental assistance money was not dispersed as quickly as some landlords may have preferred. So we worked really hard to put together a process and a team that could uh, get applications through the system quickly. Um, as the data system was adapted to allow us to pay all of these funding sources at the same time, um, that happened at the end of April. Um, I'm pleased to report uh, that since the end of April, when we started doing that, uh, we've been able to disperse $144,000 of housing stabilization program money, uh, and that serves 42 households in the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, the average uh, assistance amount was about $4,000, uh, and many of many of those allocations were put together with other funding sources to be able to pay off large balances of rent and allow folks to remain in their housing. Uh, we're able to pay around 170 uh, applications a week. Uh, we are able to, we have been uh, preventing about 15 lockouts a week in real time 
So folks who come to us really at the very, very end of, of the line where their landlord has an order for possession and would be able to lock them out at that time, uh, we're able to uh, get emergency checks to assist. They can come to our office and pick it up if necessary. Um, so we've worked really hard and really appreciate the opportunity to add this housing stabilization program money into our portfolio so that we can really try and stabilize the housing in Allegheny County and the city of Pittsburgh. Um, for folks who may be eligible, um, one other thing to note is that the housing stabilization program money is unique in our program as it is the one funding source that allows folks to come to us with a notice to quit. Um, notice to quit being the 10, 30, sometimes 15 day notice uh, before an eviction filing occurs. Uh, as you know, once an eviction filing occurs, that can really do harm to a tenant's uh, history of renting. It can affect their ability to get rentals moving down the line. So we really appreciate the opportunity to be able to help people before they get to that point. And we're doing lots of things to try and increase awareness around that so that we can get to folks earlier in the process and not have to wait till the trauma of preventing an actual lockout the day that it occurs. So if folks are uh, eligible that, that you're aware of, there are a couple different ways that they can come to us. Uh, they can call our hotline at Action Housing, uh, which I can provide at 412-248-0021. Um, the Allegheny link, now has a direct referral from their data system into our data system. So we can get referrals from them in real time and reach out to them uh, a lot of times on the very same day or within a, a few days to get things started. We also have a walk-in space uh, in downtown Pittsburgh, which is at 415 7th Avenue. Uh, it's a storefront. It is right next to a subway. It comes with free smells. Uh, that you can smell all day long. Uh, it is open from uh, 9.30 to 4.30, Monday through Friday. Uh, we also get referrals directly from the courts uh, at the Housing Court Help Desk. Uh, folks who may come downtown to court with their landlords, they sometimes are able to walk over together, uh, provide us with a judgment, and we're able to, at times, if we have everything we need, pay on the spot. So. We're really excited with how the collaborative is working. Uh, we're working every day to improve our relationships in the community, to get the word out that this assistance is out there. Um, and yeah, uh, I thank you for the opportunity to share this with you. And I look forward to having even more statistics uh, at your next meeting. So some pretty exciting stuff are dollars on the ground. If folks have specific questions for Natalie about the dollars, the services, the way Action Housing is you know, operating the program. Well, I, will none, also, I will also note there's one other thing that they're working on, which is getting our, our, our data tracking up and running for each program specifically. Um, so that's something that I believe they're looking to put on a dashboard that is public. Um, so I will certainly keep everybody apprised if that happens so that you can actually view it in real time as it happens. Wonderful. Well, and I feel confident if the group, you know, at a later time, individual members have questions for Natalie, I feel confident that she would be happy to field those. Absolutely. But if there's nothing that's really burning or pressing right now, you know, those ideas can keep coming forward and questions in a future dialogue with Natalie. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. This was great. Well, moving on to more dollars in action, we do have um, an application to review, and we're going to have the URA present that application for us for Bedford Dwellings. Folks may remember this is a multi-phase project, and this is an exciting update. Thank you, Adrian. Hi, everyone. My name is Niklas Person. I'm a lending analyst in the residential lending department of the URA, and today I'm requesting from the board authorization to enter into a rental gap program loan agreement 
with a borrower Bedford Dwellings Phase 1B in the amount of $1 million to be used towards the new construction of Bedford Dwellings Phase 1, the first development phase in the Bedford Choice Neighborhoods Initiative in the Hill District. The site of development is currently vacant land and lies at the intersections of Reed, Miller, Roberts, and Heldman Street in the Crawford Roberts neighborhood between Center Avenue and Fifth Avenue. The borrower is a single purpose entity formed by the Housing Authority of the City of Pittsburgh and Trek Development Incorporated. This phase would be a team development effort between the two, and it involves using this land to construct 62 new residential units. All of these units would be rented affordably to tenants with incomes no greater than 30, 50, and 60% of area median income. 53 of these units will hold project based vouchers and will serve as one for one replacement housing for residents living in the Somers Drive units of the current Bedford dwellings. This reflects one of the overarching goals of the Bedford Choice Neighborhoods Initiative, which is to provide one for one replacement housing for all current residents of Bedford dwellings. The development team will be utilizing multiple different funding sources for phase one, including 4% low income housing tax credits. Allies and Ross Management and Development Corporation dollars, as well as Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency dollars. The funds will be used to construct a six story, 43 unit apartment building for seniors 55 and over, and the construction of six townhouses along Reed and Heldman Street, respectively. The total development cost for phase 1B is $27,851,888. The developer has approached the URA requesting additional gap financing to the rental gap program for both phase 1B and phase 1A. As context of the board, phase 1A is the other portion of Bedford Dwellings phase 1, and it will be funded with 9% low income housing tax credits and involve the additional construction of a four story, 30 unit apartment building along Reed Street and 12 townhomes along Miller Street. Both loans for phase 1B and 1A would be structured as cash flow. Uh, repayment loans with a term of 40 years and a 0% interest rate. A deed restriction would also be made to secure long term affordability over a period of 40 years. The RGP loan for phase 1A would be sourced with home investment partnership program funds and the phase 1B loan would be sourced from the housing opportunity fund, which is why I have come to the HOF board requesting authorization for just phase 1B. The loan amount is set at $1 million. However, the loan amount may increase to 5 million if the URA receives community development block grant fiscal year 2023 funds in support of the Bedford Choice Neighborhoods Initiative. The development team is aiming for a closing for Bedford Dwellings Phase 1 at the end of the summer with construction to be completed by the summer of 2025. And that is my presentation. Thank you all so much for your time. I have myself as well as I believe Addy Cullen, John Inyoki, and Bill Gaddy of Trek Development to help in answering any questions you guys have. Do we have specific questions from the board or would we like to talk to the team? Are there specific questions for the team about the project? We are so quiet today. This is surprising. Thank you to everybody who came on behalf of this project. I can I can see we have a nice group here. Is there anything that you would like to share with the board before we, you know, dive into motion making and voting? No, nope. uh, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for your uh, support and know about this choice effort. We've uh, we've contacted a lot of you and been working a lot really hard with it. Um, and look forward to ongoing projects uh, to help support this uh, choice initiative in the Hill District. Thank you so much, Addie. If there are not questions or comments, do we have a board member that would like to bring forward a motion as outlined here on the slide? Um, this is Derek. I don't want to bring forward a motion. I have to recuse myself, um, but I do have a question. Um, can you remind me of how many units was in this phase? It would be 62 units. 62 units, okay. And, and just for 123 total between both okay. phases. Got it. 
And Derek did raise an important point. Do we have others that will not be motioning or voting on this particular project due to potential conflicts of interest? I also, this is Karen, I also have to recuse myself from this um, vote as well. Thank you, Karen. Madam Chair, I'm happy to make the motion if I can figure out where you have the motion summarized. It's here on the slide. We are moving to the verbiage at the bullet point. Correct. Perfect. I motion to authorize to enter into a rental gap program loan agreement with the borrower Bedford Dwellings Phase 1 B LLC or a related entity in an amount not to exceed $1 million for the new construction of Bedford Dwellings Phase 1B. And congratulations, this looks like a great project. Do I need a second? Yeah, second. I'll second, this is Alan. Great, thank you, Alan. All those in favor, can you please say aye? Aye. 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 We have our list of abstentions. Anybody who is voting nay on this um, motion? Well, great. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to our Bedford Dwellings Phase 1A and fun, one, Phase 2B, one, 1A and 1B partners. <laughs> this does look like a very exciting development, and we'll be excited to continue to hear about your progress. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have some interesting conversation to pick up from our last meeting and that's going to be led by Evan and we're going to talk about our for sale development program amendments. Yes, th thank you, Adrian. Um, yeah, so following up on last month where we uh, tabled the discussion on the for sale development program amendments, um, bringing it back to the board's attention this month, um, I'm happy to run through some of these changes again at a high level. Um, that we're looking to make to the for sale development program um, and can go in depth on any of them as well if, if, if asked about. Um, but I do want to note that a marked up version of the program guidelines that included these changes was sent out last week um, for those that might have had some questions about how these, these types of um, changes would be structured in the actual documentation for the program. So uh, the changes that were uh, looking to address with, with these amendments are to uh, actually allow for conservatorship um, explicitly. The, the guidelines re, uh, previously were silent on it. And so um, being able to clear that up with prospective applicants uh, is, is one benefit that these amendments will bring. Um, creating more guidance around the use of limited equity cooperatives and, and allowing them to participate. Um, this has been another part of the uh, for sale housing uh, ecosystem that, that largely remains underserved. And so the ability to help either preserve limited equity co-ops or help uh, groups of existing tenants organize to become a limited equity cooperative um, to then provide uh, shares to those, those tenants as they move it into that LEC format would be uh, another change considered in these amendments. Um, a period of eligible costs spanning one year prior to when the application uh, has been made to the URA, and this is to help just ensure that the URA um, inspection staff is, is able to be in the loop about the scope of work going on at these properties. Um, and that what we're really funding here is either acquisition, rehab, or new construction, and not necessarily um, any type of speculative activity. Um, whereas the URA does have programs that should a nonprofit development entity purchase a home and say rent it for several years and then try to a um, few years down the line sell the home, um, having not anticipated that it eventually would be a for sale opportunity. Um, that would be covered by some of our deferred buyer financing that we have through um, our own PGH program and also uh, what's called the housing recovery um, program run out of the URA that provides deferred second mortgages to, to buyers. Um, I did skip a bullet here that we have a rent to own model also that is now 
eligible. So this is for for nonprofit developers that are um, setting out with the intention that they will need to rent the home um, or want to rent the home for some amount of time to a household that's getting ready for home ownership. Um, they'll be able to do that through the rent to own model. And then lastly, and, and I think very importantly, is increasing the per unit subsidy um, uh, from 70,000 for rehabs to 100,000, and then for new construction from 100,000 to 130,000. Uh, there was some questions last month about kind of how that affects our production, our pipeline. And um, I think our response to that is that there are a lot of projects that do not, um, that, that have to do additional fundraising through programs that either have timelines that don't, you know, that are semi-annual or, or are annual and these projects would just wait around for a year and we end up kind of sitting on funds at times. Um, I don't think we have a tremendous backlog in this program, but I know that we're still um, spending our program year 2022 funds for the for sale development program. Um, and meanwhile, we're halfway through 2023. So I think we could unlock some of our pipeline as well and, and get projects moving by um, allowing some more subsidy, recognizing that uh, the conditions for developers trying to do this work has changed a lot since these guidelines were first created or last updated just with the rise in, in uh, property acquisition costs. Um, uh, their costs during construction on interest uh, for construction loans, construction costs themselves have increased along with materials. So that is the basis for why we would propose to uh, uh, allow for more per unit subsidy. And when we look at other programs that are often involved in the for sale development space, like the Federal Home Loan Bank's Affordable Housing Program, um, I think that what we're proposing here is a bit more in line with what peer funders are also offering on a per unit basis. Um, we can obviously, if, if we have to close the program down because we've, uh, you know, committed everything and are spending it at a clip that outpaces us receiving new allocations, um, I think we can reassess this. But right now, I think it would be a very good uh, opportunity for our development partners to, to be able to move some of their pipelines along. So I'll uh, stop there, but happy to take any questions or um, respond to comments. Councilwoman Gross, I think your hand is up. Yeah, thank you, Adrian. I um, so I'm really happy to see the limited equity housing co-ops uh, added here. I really appreciate that. I'm excited about their potential and kind of bringing back this historic form. I think I probably mentioned previously that I've passed um, a resolution at council to help council understand and explore how we can help foster collective ownership and. If there are any barriers, we should remove those barriers. And I really appreciate the URA has been responsive in, in engaging in that um, kind of inquiry. And so um, I'm also uh, curious. I just don't see the map. Maybe I just missed it. So like, how big is the pot? That And then how many units are produced? And so like, if we unlock and like spin down all of the backlog, like you're talking about, like how many affordable units might we be unlocking here? Um, I, I believe in our 2022 funds, we've got um, yeah, around $800,000 remaining. And then I think the 2023 allocation had 900,000 for for sale development. So um, we're looking at about $1.7 million that we currently have uh, for the for sale development program. So I, I would, not every not every unit um, will go up to what the program maximums are, um, but I suppose, I think a lot will be close to it. I think we'd probably be looking at between like 18 to 20 um, units that between the two years allocation that we can um, probably bring to market. Um, did you say I think million? How Sorry, about one point one about one point eight or one point seven million that's currently unencumbered through the program. And if we create 20 units, we're looking at like ninety thousand dollars for bringing an affordable unit online that we don't have now. Uh yeah, I, I would say about that. 
that sounds like a bargain, doesn't it, compared to new construction? So it sounds like a great yeah. idea. <laughs> and unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave the meeting. I apologize. And so I'm, I'm going to vote yes here. Um, and on the next one, if you'll do that. Um, and thank you for answering my questions. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, Thank one you. small clarification for those that will remain is that this program does also service new construction, but um, it does. But potentially, you know, if we have these as rehabs, um, I've been just trying to repeat and make this point a lot that there are multi units on the market right now um, that probably need some rehab, but we could be acquiring them for affordable housing. Um, and it is because we've just seen this crazy increase in construction costs, right? Nearly doubling the cost of each unit, right? Um, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I'm happy to support this one today. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, are there additional questions, clarifications that folks would need? I think, Mark, is that you raising your hand? Yes. Uh, hey, I just, uh, I had asked this question the last time and I'm not sure, I, you know, I guess I was assuming that there'd be some changes or adjustments in uh, section E, the eligible costs that you've added uh, 12 months prior, uh, sort of uh, anything older than that. Uh, you know, I, I know community groups that want to utilize this program with vacant land that they've held from previous projects. They, they acquired a building and they also had to acquire uh, adjacent land or, or nearby land as part of uh, the, you know, trying to acquire the vacant properties and and, uh, and turn them over in a previous project. Um, an example is Bondview Street, where the owner had one existing building that was rehabbed. He also owned a bunch of vacant land that there had been units demolished years ago. So the community group wants to continue with that. But what you're saying is they can't treat that acquisition cost because they had to pick up this vacant land and couldn't put it into the, the previous phase. That, that's my concern. And I understand that you have folks who might be abusing it, but there's got to be some way that you can, you know, the intention has always been to do affordable for sale on that lot. And there's other community groups that have that have similar situations. And then there's community groups that have put hand money down with the city still waiting on the property because we've got them, you know, we have a troubled uh, system for, you know, to recycle um, uh, vacant properties um, that are taxed and liquid and the city's taken through a treasurer sale. So, you know, those are the concerns I have. I understand that, you know, we definitely don't want to have folks that are trying to recycle stuff, uh, old news into new news. So is there a way that you can adjust these to deal with that? Uh, yeah, I, th I thank you for uh, elaborating on that. I, I think that is a um, uh, an important need for us to address in in those instances. So, um, I, I think for this, for the sake of the guidelines, we could. Um, I'm, I'm thinking we could say something towards. Uh, you know, construction costs that were incurred over beyond 12 months prior are ineligible. And then, uh, you know, acquisition and holding costs or, you know, hand money. We could, I, I think that probably falls into the acquisition bucket. Um, hand money, we could say, is uh, considered on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, I know it's a bit arbitrary, but it, the, as you mentioned, Mark, I mean, there are some times where we're just like, that's just outside of what the real intention of this program is meant to, um, of what it's really meant to serve. But I think if we, would, would you be comfortable if we were to say, you know, the things beyond a year uh, that are older than a year would be considered on a case by case basis? Yeah, or if you wanted to maybe delete that right now and then come back with a more refined uh, revision of that section, if you need more time, I mean, I, I know, okay. it, you know, this is on the spot and not expecting you to have the yeah. language, but does that work? I agree. You need to get the limits up because yeah. projects are stalled right now. Uh, and you probably have a pipeline that's going to, you know, utilize, you know, 18 units worth of funding pretty quickly. And it's probably not, this probably isn't an issue for those projects, but, you know, if we can get this uh, revamped, 
uh, maybe at the next meeting we can have language around that particular section that enables the stuff that we, you see you know we know that there's there's those sorts of plots and buildings that are out there mm -hmm. um yeah i think we could uh i think we could remove that right now and um come back at a future meeting with uh some workshop language around the the timetable there okay great I mean, is everyone comfortable with that? Or is there somebody that really wants to bring a motion to the table with what's been outlined by Evan? Is is the expectation that this will come back next month? Um, with the, yes, I believe so. I mean, if this, if the overall guidelines, like the other changes were to be approved, we could, uh, uh, have a small item next month that is just speaking to this uh, fourth bullet here about the the timetable for eligible costs. Okay. That meeting the group's expectation and really making the commitment to next month that we will have this finalized for Evan. <laughs> So if there's anything that's distributed ahead of time um, related to this particular item, please everybody take a look um, so that we can, we wanna make great decisions. We want them to be as nuanced as they need to be, but we also wanna be timely for the sake of the process. So Evan, we'll be looking for that from you. Yes, but i uh, sorry if I'm misunderstanding though, but I, I, is it possible we could take a vote on the, the guidelines Otherwise, and then we would just add that in to a future action, just to because we do have some projects that you know we we don't want to in the same month you know be fully overhauling the guidelines and taking projects. Um, so we'd like to get some new guidelines in place or updated guidelines. So if we made the changes and just uh, except for that uh, section E eligible cost with the added language and just put uh, deleted that. Would, you know, I, I would be willing to make a motion to that effect that we we adopt them, except for the provision related to uh, previous twelve months uh, expenses uh, language in uh, section E. So, Mark, are you making that motion? Yes, I am. Motion with amendments to the language can we have a second this is alan i'll second that thank you alan all those in favor aye aye aye, aye. aye. any opposition any abstentions great thank you everyone thank you evan yeah thank you I was just going to say, I don't, I don't know if I needed to abstain, being it was just an, an amendment. Um, so I'm not sure, but um, I'll just put that on record. Thanks, Derek. All right. Uh, I think the next several items are for me. Um, so I'll go ahead and jump in for some URA administrative updates. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Derek Kendall Morris. Manager of Consumer Lending within the URA's Housing Department. Um, first announcement today uh, is that the Homeowner Assistance Program will be reopening for applications on June 26th. Uh, we will be accepting applications this year from June 26th uh, up until August 4th, uh, at which time we will be closing the program again um, in the anticipation that we will be receiving uh, vastly more applications than we'll be able to approve within that time period. Uh, if that's not the case, we certainly will keep the uh, application open longer, uh, but that is the window uh, that we will currently be operating under. Um, we will not be able to accept applications before June 26th, uh, in fairness, as we you know, spread the word and make sure that everybody across the city knows that they can apply, uh, but we will be accepting them on June 26th and moving forward until August 4th. Um, the application is available on the URA website. Uh, you can also contact uh, contact us uh, for more information uh, via phone or at hof at ura.org. The phone number is 
0.255. Oh, I lost it. One second. Apologies, I'm having a computer issue. Yeah, uh, the phone number is 412-255-6694, uh, extension 6721. Uh, so they can also call us uh, and request an application, and we can certainly get one out to them. Um, so that's our, our announcement for the Homeowner Assistance Program. Um, next announcement, uh, last year, uh, this body approved uh, a grant to Action Housing uh, to help fund their efforts around the Homeowner Assistance Fund, uh, which was a statewide effort to assist homeowners um, who are at risk of foreclosure. Um, you know, Action Housing uh, accepted about $50,000 uh, from the HOF last year uh, to support that effort. Um, uh, long story short, uh, they were able to assist one client um, with those funds. Uh, due to issues, you know, statewide with the HAF and sort of the rollout of that. Um, so they have returned uh, the rest of those funds uh, to the URA um, to go right back into the um, HOF's demonstration line item, which is where those funds came out of. Uh, so that we did receive back uh, $45,480.99 uh, back into the demonstration fund. Um, so... We appreciate Action Housing um, coming to us and letting us know they weren't able to utilize those funds uh, and giving those back so that we can circulate them um, for other needs. Uh, so wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that. Um, and finally, uh, our legal assistance program, uh, we did have an application for funding for organizations that wanted to be a part of that program uh, over the last month. Um, and we did receive you know, applications from all of the partners that are currently active within the program. Um, so we do want to review those applications and get some new contracts in place uh, so that that program can continue to function. So we're just looking for volunteers uh, from uh, the advisory board, if anybody would like to uh, participate in reviewing those applications, um, along with Brianna uh, and myself from the ORA staff, uh, we would welcome that. We'd love to have a few members, if you're interested in doing so, um, please reach out to me um, and let me know uh, that you'd like to be a part of that committee. Um, so those are our announcements. I don't know if anyone has any questions. Uh, if you could reach out uh, about uh, the legal assistance program, uh, if you want to be a part of that review community, if you can let us know by June 6th, um, that would be much appreciated because we do want to get this process moving quickly so that we can have contracts uh, for our providers ready for, for July. Um, so reach out, let me know, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Lots of ways for all of us to engage. Yes. We have this opportunity for volunteering with Derek. We also have lots of space on our committees. Um, so anybody who has not chosen a committee, this is the moment. This is the best time. Um, sometimes we don't get to those emails. We forget we're all right here. If there's a committee that you really want to be participating in, you know, please, you, you know, anybody can shout out and say, I, I would like to be on this committee if you haven't yet. Um, if you're not ready to make that commitment right now, you can also, you know, send us some information and Get involved in whatever committee is, you know, really the most enticing to you that really feels like you're the most connected and the most interested in. I believe, if I'm not incorrect, none of the committees did meet this last month. So I don't believe we do have any committee report outs. So there's still plenty of time to start fresh with the committee of your choosing to really get engaged in topics that are important to you. So with no shout outs of um, committee reports or committees that folks are really wanting to sign up for right now, um, we have some great information on the allocation plan, the survey and community events. Yeah, thank you, Adrian. My name is Jeb Burns. I'm with the Urban Redevelopment Authority. 
Um, just to give an update on the 2024 annual allocation plan survey that has been released to the community. Um, at this point, we have about a hundred, or no, not 150. We have about 250 um, surveys that we received so far. So we're very happy with that. It's only been four weeks since we launched the um, survey and we still have two more months left of collection. So we're gonna continue you know, pushing that survey and we have a series of additional community events. Um, I'm gonna go through some of those right now. Again, if any of you are interested in joining us for any of these events, please just reach out and let me know. You're welcome to join. If it will let me go to the next page here. There we go. So we did have two already. Um, we had one at the Hazelwood Initiative and we had one at the Bloomfield Garfield Corporation. Uh, they both went really well. There was a lot of input. I was at the Hazelwood Initiative one. There was a lot of um, input and we collected a lot of surveys at that time. Um, All together, I think we collected about 20 to 30 at that event. I would have to go back and look at the exact number, but um, I was pleased with the turnout for that. Uh, we do have two upcoming at the Pittsburgh Hispanic Development Corporation. They're having a consulate event over the weekend of the 10th and 11th. Um, we're going to be there all day with them for people that come through and go through that process. Um, and they're going to have translators for anybody that would speak Spanish or Portuguese so that they can work with us. And they also are translating um, our flyer so that they can provide it to people. We already have the survey in Spanish, um, so it'll be easy access for individuals that are looking to do that. Uh, we have 31st Ward Community Meeting on the 13th, East Hills Consensus Group on the 15th. Perry Hilltop Fine View Citizens Council on the 27th. And then we have Carrot Community Council also on the 27th. Uh, Pittsburgh Downtown Partnership, we're gonna go to the Market Square Farmers Market and table there. Uh, Lawrenceville United, uh, some to be determined information with that one, but that's gonna be on July 13th. And then Sheridan Community Council and Jasmine Nairi on July 15th, we're uh, meeting at the Sheridan Family Dollar Pavilion um, and holding a joint event with them. So we're excited about all the events we have, much more than we had in the previous year. Um, good turnout, the ones we've had so far. So hopefully that continues and we um, get a lot more feedback. And I guess I can just uh, continue on uh, for a matter of time since we ha only have a few minutes left. Um, I will try to go through quickly through our regular program expenditures. So there have just been incremental increases um, in terms of you know, what has gone forward since last month. I will note with the disbursements um, for HSP, some of the information that Natalie discussed, um, we received that today. So I didn't have time to input it um, into this but that would be the additional 140,000 that she mentioned of disbursements for the housing stabilization program. Um, and then as well as what Derek had mentioned in regard to money coming back into the demonstration dollars. Um, so in terms of what is available and like committed here, it would be 50,000 less. So we're about at 1 million, uh, what has been committed at this point then. Four. Uh, and I'm just going to go through our uh, each program as per usual by uh, AMI level and council district. So for the down payment and closing cost assistance program, these are percent of funds by council district and AMI level. And as usual, if you have any questions about anything on here, uh, just shout out. The legal assistance program, we have present households by council district and AMI levels. Housing stabilization program, present households served by AMI and council district. And again, this probably will change a little bit once we get those additional figures from action housing put in here. For the homeowner assistance program, we have present projects um, by council district and then some of that additional information about committed and closed and what's in the pipeline. And these numbers do fluctuate a little bit from month to month as projects actually have the amount determined of, you know, how much is going to be for each project. 
large concern mediums. For the forest sale development and rental gap program, there haven't been any additional changes in terms of uh, what was on from last month. And the demonstration dollars, there's only going to be the one change. Um, in again, going back to what Derek had mentioned, um, I haven't had the opportunity to take it off of here yet, but that will adjust these percentages um, once that 5% vanishes from here. Well, there still will be a certain amount because they did spend a little bit of it, like Derek had said, um, but it was just one individual, so it's not going to be super substantial. And that's all I got. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. It was great dialogue today. Um, lots to take in. We have lots of opportunities for tapping back. Um, so if you have any thoughts about Section 504, you can reach out to myself and Megan, and we can make sure that we get your thoughts incorporated into those notes. Um, the Housing Authority was kind enough to send us a lot of great information. Um, from their perspective. So we'll be incorporating that. We'll be circulating notes back out um, so folks can feel comfortable with anything we're going to submit to HUD. There's lots of opportunities for committee engagement. If you would like to host a community event, um, there's lots of time left for the survey. So if you have that interest, please tap back to the URA and they can work with you to make that happen. Um, is there any business that the group um, would like to discuss in our last few minutes? Kelly, we're Kelly. Yes. Oh, sorry. I'm okay. Okay. <laughs> I did not want to cut you off, um, Madam Chair. If there are no other items, um, do we have a motion for adjournment? I just wanted to ask a quick question with volunteers and committees. Uh, we have the committee chairs, uh, are, uh, and do we have? have enough members signed up because I, I I have uh, you know I completed the survey I just want to be sure you guys have that and didn't mess up on on you know inputting what I was going to try to serve on but then can we get a commitment for the committee uh, chairs to actually get a meeting uh, between now and the next board meeting or uh, advisory board meeting yeah I can resend the um list to everybody again that just has you know who the committee chairs are and the members of each committee there are people that have volunteered for each one so there's at least somebody on each of the committees um i will note one of the committees we had accidentally put alan as the chair of that committee so i do apologize to alan there was a misinterpretation at one point in time um, but that one is still looking for somebody to chair that committee i did send an email out to the individuals in that group um, but if somebody from that particular uh, committee is willing to chair, uh, please let us know. But I will send out the list again, which will also be updated to not have Alan as the chairperson um, for that committee. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> You're welcome. I want to be on that committee badly. I just don't have, I just <laughs> don't know that I have the time to leave it. But are we able then to have the committee, you know, if not, if there's not a committee chair, Jan, you know, is that something that the staff can pull together at least to get started until they can pick one? Or maybe a co-chair relationship. Yeah. Alan seems very excited and interested. Maybe there are two folks that could support the committee. And Alan, I'd be willing to, if you want, I can work with you and we can at least set up the meeting and then um you know whoever you guys choose at that meeting to be the chair then we can we can put that on there but i can i can help at yeah, least let's have the me let's up. have a meeting let's have the meeting of everybody who said they want to work on that committee and we'll uh you know make that an agenda item did any of the other committee chairs want to comment on meeting or are you recruiting heavily and want to make a statement?
Well, we will look for those lists again from the URA. Thank you for providing that information again. Um, and for our chairs, we all are really excited to meet in July. So we will just be waiting for you to call on us so that we can participate. Any other final items? Move to adjourn. Second. Well, we got lots of hands there. So we have our movement to adjourn. Thank you, everyone. We are really looking forward to completing the survey process, getting these community meetings um, under our belt and hearing all of the wonderful things um, from our community members and getting that level of engagement. And we will see you all for the July meeting of the advisory board. Um, but we also anticipate we'll see you before then in our committee groups. Thank you everyone, we're adjourned.